Good evening. Call the special meeting to order at 6 p.m. and I'll turn it over to our uh, building consultant, Mr. Farmeroy. Uh, good evening. Thank you for coming tonight. My name is Richard Pomeroy from Pomeroy Associates. And myself, along with uh, Andrew DiGiamo, DiGiamo uh, from Compass Group Architecture, is going to provide you with the results of the feasibility study that we've conducted over the last several months uh, for the uh, Raynham uh, Fire Department uh, portion of the building. <coughs> The overall, uh, the beginning of the assessment was to look at the options to put a, uh, a bunk room on top of the existing facility <coughs> and, you know, determine the best means and methods to accomplish that. Uh, part of that process was to do a full study of the existing facility to completely understand uh, what you have right now and how we can build off of that. And during that process, uh, we've, uh, we've discovered a lot of, uh, uh, of eye-opening uh, items that we wanted to bring to your attention. Things that, uh, that the department and the town have been aware of for years, uh, things that uh, you know, we'd like to bring to your attention to help, uh, help you understand part of our recommendations and some of the decision-making decision process that's taken place over the last several months. So what we're going to do is uh, we're going to give you a walk down the path of uh, of our illustrious architect and their and their role in this response in this responsibility, and that's really looking at, as I said, your existing facility, and how does it work now, how will it work in the future, and how does it meet the needs of the department, or how does it not meet the needs of the department, uh, and all the while considering growth within the community. So I'm just going to turn it over to Andy. Uh, Andy, I may jump in once in a while to add one uh, uh, thing here or there, but uh, it's your show right now. Thank you, Rick. Hi, I'm Andrew D. Jamo, Compass Group Architecture, if you don't know me. Uh, first off, there's some handouts on the counter. If you haven't gotten any, there's both an 8 half by 11 packet and 11 17. Grab one. So <coughs> over the last uh, few months, I've been um, studying your existing public uh, safety facility and your, particularly your fire department, its operations, what equipment it has, and how it functions. So tonight we're going, I'm going to present to you what I found and um, we we're also tasked with seeing if we could uh, add to the addition that's on the side. I have an answer for that tonight and um, also a come up with a solution uh, based on what I found. Wrong way. There we go. <clears throat> so the objectives uh, tonight we're going to discuss uh, the existing site conditions at, on Orchard Street, the existing building, which is seven hundred and seven thousand four hundred twenty-five square feet. I'm going to discuss a space needs assessment. This all began with us giving your department a questionnaire that they filled out, a packet of information. Uh, it's pretty thick, about this thick, right, Jim? Uh, it, it asks every question. And so they start with that, and we start by looking at their building and their equipment. And from those two things, um, we put together a, a plan and some recommendations. So um, that's the space needs assessment. And you'll see that the space needs assessment, which is in your packet, I've, we've organized it into three columns. The first column is white. The white column is an ideal or an industry standard. I won't say ideal. That's an industry standard for a, a, a town of your size. And uh, you know the type of buildings you have in your town, how many people on your force. The middle column, which is light gray, which I, I'm going to go to that. I'm going to go there for I'm going to get there for you. Oops, sorry about that. This is going into a mode that uh, I don't typically use. Here 
we go. That's back in the book. So let me run down the, um, I'll, I'll run down the overview for, for you, and then we'll get back to that space needs assessment. So we're going to look at uh, the space needs assessment, which uh, I made that table for you, and I'll, I'll talk to that when we get to it. And then we're going to look at the pre-engineered metal building that sits on the site, the 40 by 60 building uh, that's uh, currently on the site and is used for storage and as an apparatus bay for an engine and the foam truck and trailer and some other things. Then we're going to look at what I call the basics. You'll see the basics is the light gray column in your spreadsheet. Uh, the basics takes the industry standard. We had a meeting with the chief and the deputy chief and um, the police chief was also there and we said all right if we can't meet industry standard on this site what are the absolute basics that a station of your size needs to, to do what you have to do so i call that one the basics that's the light gray column um, in, in the center there and the dark gray column is what's existing so you have industry standard the basics and the existing in that spreadsheet when we get to it so we'll spend some time on the basics, and then I took the basics and I actually turned that into a schematic design that would fit on your site. It shows how we'd go from the 7,425 square feet to uh, roughly 18,000 square feet, which would, as professionals, we would think would be the minimum size station uh, for your uh, fire, fire station to work out of. Um, then we're going to talk about um, how <coughs> Uh, what challenges it would pose having the police station next door during construction and what we might do to help phase the project. And then we'll spend a little bit of time in the police department who was um, also working on a questionnaire, but they have some needs that would um, have to be addressed immediately with anything that goes on in that site. Okay, I got it now, I promise. The existing site at 37 Orchard. I'm sure you're all familiar with it. Let me get my pointer. Just to give you a quick orientation, here's Orchard Street to orient you. This is north at the top of the page. Here's the fire department and the police department right alongside it. Vehicular circulation is a U around the building with, with parking at, at various parts of the parking lot. Here is the auxiliary building that we'll talk about, the 40 by 60, 2400 square foot building. This is the big lawn out in the back, which they have some mobile storage unit that they used uh, to store some of their equipment. It's a 3.1 uh, acre site. Here's the existing floor plan to get you oriented. Um, this is the entirety of the fire station side. It's, it's with the mezzanine above, it does have a mezzanine. It's just about uh, 7,900 square feet. It, it has uh, four apparatus bays in the front and then two more that drive through in the back uh, with an addition that was put on in the 90s. So here you can clearly see the apparatus bay in this large open space. Uh, this is where they park their ladder truck and this is an ambulance to give you some scale of the size of these bays. Now over here towards the police station side is some EMS storage personnel file uh, storage files which they access through the EMS storage and their decon room. Now, I want you to notice that the only way into decon is from the exterior. So you have to go outside to get to decon. On, on this side over here, which would actually be the west side, is the administrative areas. This was uh, once in the main entry, but that's no longer used. The main entry now is over here, right in the center of the building. It's a very small uh, vestibule where the public coming in can communicate with who's ever in dispatch, tell them what their business is, and, and get let in. Uh, 
there's uh, virtually no space provided in this building for the public. Um, you know, there's no bathrooms, there's no, no public support areas whatsoever, no public service areas. So this is the dispatch room over here. Comes into this main corridor that runs along here. And if you come in, you would take a left, you'd go back towards administration. This is where all the administrative functions go on. Uh, plan, this is where they accept the plans, uh, billing, and just day-to-day -day administrative operations. Adjacent to that is the fire chief's office right here. The fire chief's office is really the only office in the building and the only place you could meet with anybody. So if you had it in a meeting, this would be your only spot right here in the office. There is two bathrooms in this building. I don't call them toilet rooms because both of them do have a shower. But there's one over here off this corridor area that would be used by admin and there's one down here in the bunk rooms over here and there is no gender separation at all in this building uh, at any level for the firefighters, for the public, uh, for admin. Uh, there's two unisex bathrooms that would be. Uh, so then there's a day room that's to the right of dispatch and uh, this is where the firefighters live really over in here. Here's their kitchen and the day room and the, their bunk room. There's six bunks over in this room. That's right adjacent to a locker room where they have all lockers. And here's the other toilet room with the shower. And um, these are the only areas to shower in, in the place. And again, there's no gender separation. There is a shower in Decon. Um, and I'll talk about that later when we talk specifically about Decon. So out in the apparatus bay, apparatus bay, um, the apparatus support areas, which are really very important spaces, uh, right off the apparatus bay area. H here's the SCBA fill stations where they fill their tanks. That room is right here, but that has about seven functions, as I'll talk about later. And um, that's the extent of the plan. The only spaces above this are a mezzanine which I'll show you, there's no more second floor spaces. So, um, let's run through. Advance the slides for you, Andy. I Ready think to go. Um, I think the arrow should work now. Yeah, I think we're good. The existing section through the building. Uh, the, the, this, this building on 37 Orchard Street was originally designed and used as a town hall and a, D, a, a highway bond, DPW bond. So the apparatus base, uh, really the old highway bond base, with an addition that was put on uh, off the back in the 90s. The um, inside this apparatus bay, there's also a mezzanine, which we can see in section here. I'll, I'll talk about that a little later in the photos. The uh, addition, it, the the original building is type three B construction. That means it has masonry bearing walls and a steel bar joist roof with wood plank deck. The additions that were put on later is five B construction. Five B construction is uh, house construction, basically. It's unprotected uh, wood frame construction. So the nine, anything put on in the 90s is 5B. And then there was an addition around 2000, uh, which I'll show you later, that's uh, a single width masonry block. Uh, like I said, the uh, building was built in 57 with the additions built in the 90s. Here's a view of the back of that building, which clearly shows the 57 uh, station with its apparat two apparatus bays in the back and that 90 addition, that's 5B construction. So this is a view of that steel bar joist with the wood plank deck and the masonry walls that make this a 3B construction. Here's the mezzanine we talked about. The mezzanine has many uses, storage, the water heaters up there, and the compressors for the fill stations. 
Now, here's, here's a view of that 1980s edition. You can see that it's all unprotected wood frame. What you see in here is the original edition with some Texture 111 boards. Then on top of that was built a two by six wall when they built this bay out around 2000. Still use 5B construction as you can see the two by 10 rafters up on top exposed. Uh, all 5B construction in this portion. I'm going to discuss the building envelope, the existing building. Let's, I'm going to start with the roof. The existing roof consists of EPDM, which is a black rubber. Uh, it's, it's, and it's over two layers of inch and a half insulation, so they have three and a half inches of insulation below it. The majority of the roof membrane was installed in the 90s, is over 20 years old. The lifespan of this type of roofing system is typically 20 to 30 years. And it's shown its age, as you can see in this view over here. Uh, a lot of the flashing conditions are pulling away. We can see that over here. And uh, that's typical of a, a roof, of a roof this age. The masonry boiler chimney. This building is heated with two gas-fired masonry <coughs> boilers. And here's the chimney that vents them. This is the chimney cap right here. The, um, the water just pours down through the building and, and saturates the chimney. You can see it here. You can see that this masonry is just full of water and you can see it trying to get out wherever it can in, these, in, in the seams where the bricks are. Um, this chimney is, is in need of help and um, needs to be re rebuilt. The uh, Plymo vent or the vent that exhausts the trucks the direct exhaust system is located right near this chimney up here. This is still the functioning plymouth vent on the roof. The masonry walls. The, uh, the, the 1957 masonry walls have no insulation between uh, the brick veneer and the CMU block. So virtually the walls have no insulation in between them. The, it, you can see that um, these walls get soaked. You can see the moisture inside the wall is pushing the paint off on the inside of the CMU that you can see peeling here. Again, uh, up here you can see the moisture just getting in uh, to, the, to these masonry veneers and, and soaking it. Again, you can see signs of effervescence here or the lime coming out of the mortar from, it, from excessive moisture. Uh, the only um, chance of insulation in these walls would be like a vermiculite that would be poured between the cores at this time, but I could not find any signs of it with some blocks that had already been um, knocked out uh, above to get into a loft, um, short of drilling holes through the wall to see if there's any vermiculite. Um, um, but my assumption is no from what I could gather from any hole I could find. So the 2 by 6 wood walls, this is the 1990s edition, uh, 5B construction uh, wood frame. Here you can see um, the wood's exposed be because the drywall has been peeled away, and you can see the fiberglass bat coming out of the insulation right here and in the ceiling up here. But these walls are nothing but uh, 2 by 6 framing uh, with, uh, you know, a typical uh, anchor bolt attachment to the foundation. The original 57 uh, structure is clad with brick that um, it is exhibiting signs of saturation all over. I can see it in this corner here. You can see how the mortar changes color. Uh, the brick seems to be saturated in uh, many places. The north and west side of the wood frame additions are clad with a simulated brick vinyl siding panel. Uh, what we're looking at here is where the emergency electrical goes into the building. Uh, this is not brick, it's just a vinyl brick. You can see that it's pieced together, some pieces falling apart. And again, you can see that it's exhibiting signs that there's just moisture behind it, just trying to get out uh, wherever it can, right over here. A portion of the west side of the building at the apparatus bay door is a single width, split face CMU block. So this was built um, around 2000. It's a single width, meaning that there's just the block. The block you see outside is the block you see inside. And again, it's showing signs of uh, water infiltration uh, all around it. Here you're seeing the lime getting 
driven out through the wall from the mortar. There's two types of windows on the fire department side of the building. There's wood gliders, these over here. Uh, they're in, uh, these are in very poor condition and need replacement. Uh, paint is coming off them. And you can see uh, this is that vinyl siding again. <coughs> see it buckling around that window where water gets in around its head. And uh, there's double hung windows, vinyl double hung replacement type. These are in satisfactory condition and are working well. And there's also hopper windows that um, fold in that are also vinyl and those are also in satisfactory condition. So those are the three types of windows that are on the fire station side. There's three types of exterior doors. There's a roll up overhead doors. They seem to be in satisfactory condition and some seem to be fairly new where they move the header up to allow for larger trucks. And aluminum storefront doors at the main entries and uh, the entry over here that's not used anymore those are, in, those are older and in poor condition. And there's some residential type steel doors with some storm doors out in front. This is the door that goes into the bunk area. Those are in poor condition, starting to rust. The domestic water service comes into the building in the apparatus bay. Here you can see it right here. Um, this is the, the water feed for the building. Here they use it to fill their trucks uh, with a gate valve that they hook up to and uh, fill the tanks on their trucks up. The electric service. The electric service and the emergency generator service enters the building on the west side. The main service is run underground and is fed from a pole located in the church parking lot to the north. The emergency electrical service runs underground from the generator that's located out by the auxiliary building. And the gear is mounted in the vinyl clad 2x6 exterior wall. Here's that wall right here. There's that picture I took before. This is what we were looking at right over here. The current service is 400 amps. 120 to 08 volts, but then that's split. The fire station gets two and the police station gets two. So there's 400 coming in, but they split and give and give two to each. Most, the most residential services are 200. Yeah, uh, and um, what um, the and the electrical service inside is scattered. There's no electrical room. There's no rated electrical room for the emergency panels which should be too all rated, and uh, panels are scattered throughout the building. The gas service enters the building on the right side, on the west side. Here's a gas service right over here, um, and here's a bollard that, that got knocked over uh, that protects that service. <clears throat> the existing facility is tied into town sewer. And all the exposed, uh, all the uh, waste piping that is exposed or I could expose is cast iron. Uh, you can see some of that over here in the uh, in the tank fill room. The entire facility, except for the bunk room in the auxiliary building, is heated with two gas-fired boilers that deliver heat through the building via fin tube radiation. There's two uh, gas-fired boilers off the apparatus bay. These both vent into that chimney that we looked at before um, that needs to be replaced. Uh, here's the two gas-fired boilers. Uh, they um, heat through these uh, fin tube radiators that run throughout the building, both on the police station and the fire side. The apparatus bay is heated with these space heaters uh, that are located up in the ceiling of the apparatus bay. The Auxiliary building is heated with gas space heaters that are hung from the ceiling and vented right up through the roof. There's combustion at each one of those units. You can see two there. The bunk room is heated and cooled with a newer heat pump system. Here's its condenser right here. That, um, here's a refrigerant tubing that goes up and into a wall-mounted um, unit. The existing 911 system is on the police station side, and that does have its own mini split um, for cooling. On the fire station side, uh, they, they're air conditioned with a residential type system that is located right here next to the um, soda vending machine in the closet. Um, 
this is the unit right here. You can see its uh, main uh, trunk right here with a supply coming off of it. Its condenser is up on the roof, up on the low slope, slope roof directly above it. That's the public uh, entrance vestibule. Correct? This is the public entrance vestibule view right here where the public comes in. Uh, ventilation. There is currently no mechanical fresh air being brought into the fire station side. Um, there is no fresh air introduced in the heating cycle when it's being heated by radiation and that's a residential type system with no fresh air being, uh, it has no economizer or any means of bringing fresh air. So the only air change <coughs> into this building is what leaks in or out through an open door or a leaky window or, uh, or a leaky door. Uh, the police station side does have some rooftops with economizers, but not on the fire station side. The apparatus base. The current apparatus areas contain four bays, of which two have limited drive-through capabilities. They are limited by the size of the overhead doors on the west side of the building. All the doors are undersized compared to today's standard preferred size of 14 wide by 14 tall. The average height from the concrete slab to the bottom of the roof joist is 14 feet. The roof joists are sloped, but the average height is 14 feet from the bottom of the joist to the slab. While the preferred height for a new fire station apparatus bay would be 18 clear from that slab up to the bottom of the joist. The mezzanine that we've talked about before within the apparatus bays is used for air compressors, hot water heater, other mechanical functions and general storage. The mezzanine does not have full head height. Uh, new fire stations are typically designed with mezzanines inside. It's used for both training and storage. <coughs> the apparatus bays are equipped with a plyo vent, direct capture vehicle exhaust system. The apparatus bays are also equipped with compressed air and electric reel system. The apparatus bays do not have a proper floor drain system. Uh, out on the main floor, they do have these rectangular bays in the center, and the floor is pitched to it, as you can see some flow from the water getting to it. But on, on the two outside bays with the two doors, they're drained um, through this cast iron pipe that they, uh, they cut with a grinder, some grooves into it. This is what um, drains the shower unit and the deep cut. So the water flows in through this shaped concrete and into the slip that they ground with a grinder. The bunker gear or turnout gear is currently stored within the apparatus bay with no means of dedicated ventilation or UV protection. Uh, uh, bunker gear does outgas um, whatever's on it. And uh, UV also degrades it uh, or will deteriorate it more rapidly than if it's protected from the sun. You can see over here um, uh, you, know, you need a lot of room to store turnout gear. You can see that these are in the direct sun whenever the apparatus bay is open. The decontamination room. The current decon room can only be accessed from the exterior building like we talked about before in the floor plan. <coughs> there is that access. Uh, it, it, that poses both a safety issue and in climate weather along with a hygiene issue. The room is also cluttered with miscellaneous storage. The room contains an extractor does have an extractor, uh, which is really a big washing, big heavy duty washing machine, a residential dryer, and a handheld shower for the purpose of decontamination, decontaminating personal protection equipment. A proper decontamination room would also contain, which we do not have here, a large stainless steel sink with 30 inch stainless counter and a residential uh, washer to clean uh, stretcher linens and etc and also a large drying cabinet when the stuff comes out of the extractor, which is not there. The self-contained breathing apparatus fill room, or the SCBA fill room. The, SBA, the SCBA fill room is currently serving at least seven functions, and, and probably more, and does not have any equipment uh, provisions for cleaning masks, which is very important. These include the breathing tank, filling station, and storage, oxygen tank storage, uh, the station's ice machine, bottled water, bottled water storage, equipment repair, workroom, tool storage, 
an emergency electric room. In addition to the SCBA fill station, this room uh, must have a two-base stainless sink. So um, you need a two-base stainless sink in these rooms for proper washing of the firefighters' masks. Uh, there is no sink in there. And you need somewhere to dry the mask, like a pot rack and whatnot. Currently, I believe you're washing your masks in a slop sink that's right in the apparatus bay with, with no means of drying those masks. Um, there also needs to be brackets on the wall to store the backpacks and the harnesses for the breathing tanks. The personnel breathing tank should be stored on a potable rack system with wheels. And the green oxygen tanks uh, that are in there, that should go to EMS storage room. Um, and all the repair and equipment tools, such as chainsaws, grinders, everything else, that should really be moved to a separate room. And the hydration room, or the room with the ice machine and bottled water, which is important for firefighters, should be located in a separate, what we call hydration rooms, where there's an ice maker, bottled water uh, for their use. The emergency rec electrical service from the generator, that needs to be moved to a two hour rated room. By code, that's supposed to be in a two hour rated room where it could survive a fire or any other kind of emergency without going down. And it needs to be, uh, this room really should be closed off from the apparatus bay uh, with a door as a three quarter inch undercut on the bottom. Can I just add something to that, yeah. Andy? Uh, you know, as we go through this and we look at some of the solutions to these areas, we'll be uh, talking about uh, clean and, and dirty areas. Uh, the, for the slide previous to this was the uh, decon area, which is uh, very important when a firefighter is returning from an event. But uh, the the SCBA area in many in, in all new facilities is is designed almost as a clean room. There's only one function in that room, and that's the 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 SCBA equipment, the breathing apparatus that the firefighters use. And, and, and sharing it with, uh, with all of the components that Andy is pointing out here is not a, is not a, a, a healthy uh, environment for, uh, for that equipment. But, so go on, Andy, I'm sorry. Thanks, Rick. The emergency electric equipment, um, which is in the uh, fill station room, um, this, is, this is fed by the generator that's out by the auxiliary building. Uh, and like I said, uh, this should be in its own two-hour rated room. Uh, also, too, the, the current emergency operations center, or the EOC, where they would set up camp if uh, there's some kind of local emergency going on. Uh, it, it's in the police side, and it's under, undersized. Uh, typically, an EOC today is designed for 40 persons. Uh, the current one, the police station, would accommodate 20. The uh, personal hydration supplies and equipment, as I mentioned before, should have their own hygienic area or a separate room. This room should include an ice machine, a small reaching cooler for bottled water, an area, an area for, un, for storage of unrefrigerated bottled water, and a bottle fill station, a wall-mounted drinking fountain. All of these functions are currently located in the tank fill room. Uh, EMS equipment storage. The EMS storage room is a large 10 foot 6 by 18 8 area that is also used as a passage way to access the wreckage storage room. Um, so the EMS storage over here is used to get to access into the uh, personnel files. Uh, a general uh, EMS storage room and a separate EMS clean room is what we're after today. So typically there's two parts to EMS storage. There's a general storage uh, and then there's a uh, uh, what we call um, a clean room EMS storage. That is a nice stainless steel counter with a sink where you can set up your bags and has a, ref a, a refrigerator that's under lock and key where you can put any drugs and lock them up. The existing bunk room, 17 and a half feet by 22. It's an open space with six beds. Um, this, this gentleman got up so I could take the picture. That's why his bed's not made. <laughs> uh, it's adjacent to the locker room and one single bathroom and a toilet, sink, and shower. There are no provisions for female firefighters at this time uh, whatsoever. I don't know what they would do with her if she was hired. Here's a locker room that's adjacent, and here's that bunk room. There's that mini split system that heats and cools it. There's that um, residential storm door we saw from the outside. The day room. The day room is... Uh, 
is a, is a decent size. It's 14 foot by 17 foot eight with comfortable seat, seating and a good television set. It has been uh, newly remodeled and along with the kitchen, it's one of the nicest rooms in the station. Uh, there's a kitchen which um, has been newly remodeled. Uh, the only place to sit down though and eat is at this island in the middle. There is no room with a dining table, uh, with a dining room table, and uh, this kitchen is not properly vented. Administration. Uh, this is it. This is where everything happens. Billing, plan storage. Uh, this is where they accept the plans in from the public, um, and any other administrative function. And then to the right of that is a chief's office that's 12 feet by 13 foot eight. And this is the only place in this building where you could have any kind of a private meeting with anybody. Dispatch. There is currently a separate dispatch room for the fire department, although uh, in questioning it has been mentioned that this function may one be combined with police dispatch in the future. The dispatch area receives the public through a sliding window right here. This is off the vestibule. So if someone from the public comes in he can um, state his business um, through that window in the vestibule. That's the reception. Uh, there are virtually no public space, uh, spaces within the current fire department. The public enters the building through a vestibule that we saw right there. This, the window would be over here. It's five six wide by seven two deep. This vestibule entrance does not meet current handicap accessibility standard. The public can, uh, and again, the public communicates through that window there. There are, there are many um, architectural access boards or handicap violations in, uh, in this building. And none of, the, none of the toilet rooms comply and it does not have uh, an accessible entry to code. We've already talked about this, but there are only two, two toilet rooms in the entire fire station. Uh, and both are con be, uh, considered unisex, in other words, both are used by both genders. Um, one is located uh, out near the chief's office in administration, and the other one is off the bunk room. That's this one off the bunk room right there. Um, they, these toilet rooms do not meet handicap accessibility, and these are the only two showers uh, in the building also. Uh, very important in a, in, in a fire station to have a toilet room off the apparatus bay so that when they come back from a fire, they can go into the toilet room without walking through um, all of the admin or living quarters while they've just come back dirty from a fire. A structural code analysis, a, a quick structural code synopsis. This is from 780 CMR 9th edition, which is the current edition here in Massachusetts. Uh, the use of the building would fall under risk category four which is the highest one. What this means is a use group is given a risk category. So uh, an office building would have a very different risk category than a fire station. Fire stations, police stations, hospital, those are highest risk categories. So we have to design to higher standards when you're designing this building. You cannot use the same standards as an office building. You have to use greater loads, you gotta use greater snow loads, greater seismic loads, greater wind loads, everything. Uh, the thinking is, is that this building uh, must stand through anything uh, during an emergency. The second floor design load um, would appear to be 40 pounds per square foot for just a residential occupancy. This, this will start, we'll start seeing that we looked at uh, putting some living quarters up on a second floor because the second floor is very conducive to living stations, uh, living quarters in a fire station. Uh, you do not need to service it by an elevator because they're all able-bodied firefighters that get up there and it'd be a good use of space here where space is at a premium because the setbacks are so tight here and we don't have much room to add on. So that would be a standard 40 pounds per square foot uh, residential occupancy load and I have talked to the building official about that and he agrees. Uh, Rain M is in a 35 pounds per square foot uh, snow zone. Um, however, um, we take that snow and in a risk category four, we add 20% to it. Uh, that's because uh, this building has to, if, if we got that 500 year blizzard, uh, its roof has to be good, has to stand. 
Um, so, and, and uh, the wind zone is 145 miles per hour, which is for ultimate wind speed in risk category four. Now, the 145, that may sound crazy. Well, not so crazy after, what was it, Dorian? But that's not 145, um, that's not a nominal or an actual wind speed. Uh, that's a wind speed with, it's called ultimate wind speed. There's some safety as a factors, there's some uh, uh, safety factors built into that wind because it is a risk category four. So if, uh, if you convert that back down to nominal, let's put an example, say we we're gonna build a house next door, that design wind speed would be about 113 pounds. So again, that's that risk category four that's, that's adding to this. And I, we had to use these loads when we're analyzing the structure. That's what we have to compare them to. Uh, we talked about the importance factor for snow loads. It's another 20%. And the important factor for seismic is another 50%. So we take the seismic loads out of the code and um, we add another 50% to it. Uh, IBC, the International Building Code, which 2000 IBC is the code, that's the basis for 780 CMR. It does have a windborne debris requirement. Um, that, uh, for any, any buildings in uh, regions with wind speeds over 140, that means we have to protect the openings. So the uh, openings in the, in, in the fire station need to be impact resistant. So if something gets blown from the yard next door, smashes into the window, uh, it, it can't cave in and become an open structure. It's got to uh, resist a certain impact test. So all the windows either have to be impact glass or have shutters coming over them. So based on these seven points above, uh, the existing building would have to be laterally reinforced for both increased wind and seismic loads. Of particular concern are the large overhead door openings in the existing masonry building. Um, so, you know, the two types of load we look at is the one that act on it laterally and try to push the building over like this. So you can imagine that big openings in a wall, such as an overhead door for a fire truck to drive through, are very weak. Um, there's not much wall to support it. Um, so those would have to be reinforced with steel frames in, in this building um, if it were renovated. Uh, also, the existing wood frame additions are not, support, are not suitable for supporting a new second floor addition. These walls do not meet a, a risk category four criteria to put a second floor on top of it. Um, they would, um, of course you could, but it would take so much to reinforce them and how they're tied to the foundation that it'd be cheaper to take them down and put new back up. So by code, you could not build on top of these without spending a lot of money or putting good towards bad. Uh, the, the existing roof structure uh, will need to be reinforced due to new snow drifting conditions. So if we did uh, go up with a second story near that existing apparatus bay, that's gonna cause a drifting condition of the snow. That code tells you exactly how to calculate that. And we would have to reinforce the, the existing joists that are there. Fire sprinklers and accessibility. Uh, let's talk about that. This again is from 780 CMR 9th edition and also 521 CMR in Mass General Law. 520, um, 521 CMR is unique to Massachusetts. It's a uh, handicap code. It's called uh, Ar Architectural Access Board, the MAAB, and they have a whole set of standards for public buildings. Uh, due to the public safety building size and extent of the need of renovations and additions, the entire building would require fire sprinklers. So if this building was renovated, uh, due to its size and use group, it's gotta be sprinkled, and, and, and it's not. Um, uh, uh, one thing that could be looked at if you are renovating only the fire side is to develop the wall between them as a two hour fire wall, protecting all its openings and giving it the integrity of two hour fire wall so that you could phase it. Eventually it falls to be sprinkled, but that would allow you to phase it during this project and then um, handle the police side at another time. The current facility has many issues concerning handicapped accessibility. The accessible routes from the parking lot are not up to current standards. People have to understand the concept of accessible route. It's not just about uh, designating a certain amount of parking spaces and putting a sign there. You have to, from where they get out of their vehicle all the way into the building has to be on an approved accessible route. All the grades have to be uh, you know, at a certain slope. 
if, if they get over a certain slope, you need to turn into a ramp with hand rails, you need certain widths. The door has to open a certain way. You need so much room on the sides of the door. There's a lot that goes into it. But it's not just about designating a spot. And um, it has to be an accessible route all the way from the beginning. Um, this uh, facility does not have them, either on the fire or the police side. Uh, there are many issues with sizes of corridors, door swings, and general clearances. All the corridors in the buildings aren't wide enough. Where you approach a door, you need 18 inches on the pull side. When someone would approach a door in a wheelchair, you can't just pull it straight there. You need so much room on the side to come around. We don't have any of those clearances working for us there. And the only two, the only two existing toilet rooms are not handicapped accessible. Um, and they do not have the dimensions to be so, to be renovated to. You'd have to stop by taking down walls and taking space out of another room to get them there. Um, now, this comes from 521 CMR, our handicap code. If the value of the, of the new work exceeds 30% of the excess value of the existing structure, the entire building must be in compliance with 521 CMR, the Massachusetts Architectural Access Board renovations. So if, if you spend 30% uh, or more of the assessed value of the structure, not the structure in the land, just the structure, you're going to bring the whole building up to code, not just the work you're working on. So the current assessed value of the public safety facility, I got this offline, is $2,746,100. This would be a construction value of $823,830. That would be a cap. Once you spend that much, you then, to meet code, have to bring the whole building up if you're going to spend 30% or more. Um, so that would be uh, our threshold. So I talked to you about this um, special needs assessment. Uh, when, I, when, I, uh, when we took this study on, uh, it became evident to me immediately. Uh, the task at hand was look at adding a second story over the 1990s edition. Uh, I couldn't do that in, in good faith. It, it's what I would call maybe putting a cup before the horse. There were so many other things that would take priority over that as far as uh, apparatus-based support, decontamination, and things like that. So how we attack this problem is we, we, we gave the town of Rainham a questionnaire that we would give with any town or city or starting off programming a project. They fill out this questionnaire, we ask them as many questions as we can think of about, about you know, their shifts, the size of their staff, their, their, their vehicles, everything. And what we do from there is we turn that into what we call a space needs assessment, and that's in your packet. However, I didn't, we didn't don't want to just do a space needs assessment of an industry standard uh, facility, uh, what we did is we then went back and compared it to your existing on the same spreadsheet, which that's that dot break column. And then this is that basics that we talked about. We then developed a program that said, okay, um, we, we couldn't get the industry standard on the site, but um, what would make this a fully functioning stand, uh, uh, station uh, while giving up some things that may be on essential? And that's that middle grade column. So over here, I'm, I'm not going to run through every space with you. You can take that back with you and look at it. But uh, it's broken into the major uh, portions of a fire station, uh, such as the public, where the public would come in. And then it starts to get on page one. There's four pages to it. Gets into operations of the administration spaces. Now, how this, how this works is um, let's take a space like uh, the public meeting room or the EOC. We talked about the EOC, the Emergency uh, Operations Center. That room, uh, of course, it's there for emergency operations, but it also serves other functions. One of its main function is a training room uh, for firefighters and police. Uh, the magic number we shoot for those is 40 people. That, that's a magic number that has to do with training numbers and being able to get your training for free if you're able to bring other towns in to do it with you. So 40 people. And it also serves as a meeting space. I've had many meetings like this in EOCs or, or training rooms. Um, in, in, in certain towns. So uh, let's, let's take and let's look at that. Here's the public meeting or the training. So this is the occupancy. We would, uh, the industry standard would be to design that for 40 in a program. Uh, number of rooms, it's one room. Uh, and the room area is, uh, is 1,000 square feet. This is just an algorithm we've developed about if you're going to have 40 people in one room, how big should that be if it's an EOC or a meeting room like this? 
uh, and that would be a subtotal. So if there was more than one room to this program component, uh, this number would change, but it doesn't here. So if you project this over, you'll see nothing in the dark gray column because that's the existing. In the basics, uh, in meeting um, with the departments, we figured we could get away with um, 622 square feet or about 25 people if we had to. And um, I'll show you how I attack that you know, in the schematic. But that's how this table works. Like I said, we're not going to go through every one, but we will run down to the bottom. It's four pages long, and we'll see how it runs out. So let me just stop you for one second. I just want to make sure that everyone's following this path. The original charge was to put an addition on top of the existing facility to create more bunk space. In the process of reviewing the existing facility, the team uh, spent an exorbitant amount of time uh, investigating this facility and, as Andy had said, in, in all good conscience, could not just recommend building an addition on top of the building uh, to accommodate the bunks. There were far more issues that needed to be resolved within the facility. And so when meeting with uh, the small group, we talked about this, and we said, okay, so let's look at the site. We understand there's a lot of issues. What can you do to help us um, attack as many of these issues as possible? Um, and we had several different gyrations. We looked at several different plans, very quick block plans. But uh, you know, Andy had several revisions that he worked through with his team. But the bottom line was that we really needed to move off of just building a bunk room above the existing facility because it wasn't, it wasn't going to be suitable for the town of Raynham. So what can you give us as a basic, but let's compare it against the industry standard. So we've moved off of the original charge for the most part and now we're moving into how, what is the solution, the correct solution uh, for the department and for the town of Raynham. Thanks. So here we see uh, three columns. The white column is the industry standard, light gray is the basics, and dark gray is what's existing. So what happens is all these spaces get totaled up, and that's called the total net area, which is right here, and then the, gross, the net to gross adjustment. The net to gross adjustment is, is, is a factor that takes into consider wall thicknesses, corridors, anything that is an actual program space. That's about 40% in a building like this, typically. So that's what, that's what takes the uh, 14,935 square feet, takes the 40% of the net area, adds another 40% to it. And an industry standard station for a town your size, uh, with the equipment you have and the type of fires you could have, is 20,909 square feet, or about 21,000. Uh, the basics that we could live with would be 18,049 based on meetings uh, with, with some parties involved in this project. And what they're operating out of now is 7,425 square feet. So um, they're operating out of 7,425. The industry standard would be about 21,000. Um, we found that um, we could fit about 18,000 uh, on the current site adding on to this building. Andy, yeah. in that, in the final gray, uh, the darker gray column, does that number include the old building? That does not include the auxiliary building. That they're using as storage which now. Which is 24 square feet. Uh, I didn't want to include that because uh, you really can't put functions in there that are separated. It's, it, it's, it's a great uh, storage area for, you know, mechanical storage, but you do want to get that engine out of there mm -hmm. uh, for sure, that trailer. So we looked at the existing site. Uh, this is a, pose, a proposed schematic site plan. And this represents uh, the basics. This represents, uh, this is schematic site plan of that, uh, am I remembering correctly, the dot gray column. Is, is the middle column dot gray? Light gray. Light gray. This, this represents the light gray column in the middle. So um, uh, it, your, your conceptual plan is keyed. So this single hatch here, uh, right here, okay? That is a 1990s addition. Now, I'm not proposing that we keep it and build on top of it, but I wanted to show you where that were, and in this scheme, that'd be taken down and replaced with a new addition. So, all these would be new additions. 
The difference between the single hatch and the double hatch is uh, this is one story and this is two story. Um, and that's where the, um, uh, I'm sorry, some two story runs through there. The main difference is this is the 90s, where the 90s additions were. This would all be one addition, but the, 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 the solid dock hatch is one story while the double hatch is two. So um, you see that we uh, still maintained access from the site over here and uh, we, we built out about as much as we could. We, we've added just about 12 feet to what's there now. Uh, the parking goes away from along here and gets replaced out in the back here. It allows us to add another 12 feet on this side. Um, so um, you still can access the site from here. This portion is police station side uh, functions very much like it did before except we eliminated these spaces in the middle and put them out here so that um, if, if we these did go to a drive-through bay you'd have plenty of room maneuvering around here and this, uh, this would give us plenty of parking. We're showing 77 spaces um, and five handicapped in this scheme. Uh, in, in this scheme it's necessary that the auxiliary building get relocated to this back corner. Because unfortunately, it's right here, right where we want to add on uh, to this new building. So the auxiliary building would get relocated to this corner. That's what you're seeing here. And there'd be some relocated storage units over here uh, with parking uh, in this field. The public entry to the uh, addition or the fire station now would be a handicap accessible entry in the back. And um, another concept I'd like to show you here is that the police department side, in the meeting we had on August 6th, um, they stressed the fact that they do not have accessible parking. And um, two, two concerns. One is they have a planter in the front that's falling apart from uh, freeze thaw, from the freeze thaw cycle. It's coming apart and they need some accessible parking. So we pulled out the planter and made some new handicapped parking in it over here so that you can enter the police station right directly off that parking rather than coming from the side here. This is the proposed, uh, proposed schematic floor plan uh, here. If you see this, um, this is actually, let me see. The layer must have been shut off. We had to, uh, we, uh, we had to find the existing station, so uh, if you follow my light, the existing station is this right here, right now. Right here. That's the existing station. The, um, so, in this scheme, we added uh, 12 feet out, and um, you can see that we have now gotten um, six effective bays um, over here with, with these two. Let me, um, I want to go to a different slide for this stuff. Here's the front of the building, that north elevation. These would be the existing doors that are there now. The existing station uh, uh, apparatus doors end here. The wood additions come out to about here and this, this would now be all new coming over here. Oh. Sorry about that. So let me go back to that floor plan. Um, I think you've got the other program up there. What's that? I think you've got the original program up there.
I'm sorry, what happened was uh, the computer updated, I think last night, <laughs> and it changed the way I'm viewing PowerPoint. So uh, what I've used for PowerPoint for years is different for the first time tonight. <laughs> Doing some update, so it's getting me. Okay. All right, that's what I want right there. Okay. Yeah, Here's the right plan. So, this dash line right here, if you follow me, this shows the line up here of the existing station. See it? Right. That's the existing station where you can see it. Um, here you can see that um, we've added really, uh, virtually, it's, it's like adding almost three apparatus bays in this scheme. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We've put the trucks in. Uh, to give it some scale, here you can see a ladder truck, an engine, and an ambulance uh, to give it some scale. But uh, we would, uh, we basically are going to gain three apparatus bays in this scheme. And the, uh, the good part about it is one, two, three, four, five is right out to the street um, with three opening up to the back in a drive through arrangement. Uh, in this scheme, uh, we used this space. Uh, over towards the police side, which is currently used uh, by the fire station, but we gave it some different uses. And there's a mechanical room with the two boilers and this chimney that I showed you. So what was, what's really lacking in the current station is the apparatus support um, of, the, of the apparatus space. And that uh, mostly has to do with uh, decom and, and dirty and clean, which is a very important concept in contemporary fire uh, house design. So I, I color coded a sheet that just shows, a, it's, a, it's a real simple concept of this first floor. And uh, what this color coding shows, basically it, 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 it's, it's red, yellow, and green, with uh, red being dirty, yellow being a transition space, and green being clean. And it's as simple as uh, uh, when the firefighters get back into this apparatus bay, and they're dirty, um, what they have to do to get clean before going into other spaces uh, that, that should be just clean. And you can see it's as simple as getting these yellow transition spaces in the right area. So um, in, in this scheme, the decon takes place in here. So you can see um, the red apparatus bay, firefighters come in here, and they uh, go into the decon room. Their extractor's here. Uh, here's where they can uh, do the heavy washing of the turnout gear and whatnot, and then uh, proceed into this space here where there'll be a shower uh, and, and um, hand washing, boot washing, and a stainless steel sink. This area here has access both to the outside and the inside. So they come in here dirty, they transition out, and now they can enter into the clean area. Can I? Yes. Yeah. Just, uh, just to clarify the terms, dirty is not mud. Uh, dirty is carcinogens, uh, chemicals from the fire. Uh, in the fires today, uh, you know, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, it was wood, everything was burning. Now we've got vehicles with plastics in it, we have homes with primarily plastics in it, and all of that, uh, the smoke that gets on uh, all of the equipment, that needs to be extracted, uh, and the firefighters need to be clean. Uh, before they go into the clean areas. Uh, you can imagine uh, right now they're, they're coming home, they're going right into the day room, they're going into the different uh, bathroom areas. The whole goal behind, behind, as Andy said, contemporary fire uh, station design is to separate those areas to make a clean, safe environment for all of the uh, occupants of the building as well as the public. Thank you. So that's one of the biggest drivers in, in, in the floor plan design. When we set out to, to design this. So the other thing I want to show you is th this is where the turnout gear would be. And um, you can see how many lockers it takes. And this would be an area that's uh, dark and can be ventilated, effectively ventilated. So when they put it in there, this could be separately ventilated. So uh, um, this is where they would store all the turnout gear. So you can see uh, it's a simple concept. But if it's not thought of from the beginning, um, you don't get that clean transition that you would like. So go from dirty to a transition space to clean. So, um, and then of course, all the second floor area now would be clean. With um, this stairway would be the uh, transition stairway that 
they'd use if they had to get out from that area. That's why that's shown up as yellow. But um, we'll, I'll go back and we'll talk about these uh, these schematic floor plans. But wanted to introduce that zoning concept. So going back to the floor plan, I think the apparatus bay is uh, clear and easily understood. Like I said, here's our turnout gear now, all lined up in a room that uh, is protected from UV and would uh, vent out directly. Here's that all-important toilet room off that apparatus bay that a firefighter can use um, directly off the apparatus bay. Hydration station, separate room, separated with a door, working right off the access bay so they could get stuff out quickly um, uh, when they needed to in an emergency. And then, um, this is that flow of dirty to clean and then out into these clean areas. Um, so this is the decon room with the extractor, the, the dryer, and um, um, a residential washer and dryer for washing linens down in here. Um, then the decon room and you're out. Now um, here's the um, fill station room, uh, right over here. A whole separate room, uh, it does have a door. I don't know, that layer must be shut off, but uh, this, this would have a door that closed. And um, this, this is all apparatus support now. This is all what's missing from the existing plan. Uh, this is what would give them that support. The decon, uh, the fill station, uh, the mechanic space where now you know, they could uh, service their chainsaws in a nice separate room like this instead of in the fill station room. Um, some nice general storage. And uh, this over here is a, a water service room that would uh, uh, bring in a new, uh, not um, just a new domestic, but also the fire sprinkling which uh, service which would come into here. Uh, a big part of the plan are these two uh, one hour rated stairs uh, required by code. I looked at every exception I could to see if um, only one would be required, but um, we, we don't make it. So uh, we need two fire rated stairs uh, to service a building this size and this type. Uh, we'll look at the living quarters which be above it, but um, the crux of this plan now that you've had time to digest it, apparatus bays, apparatus support, turnout gear area, and then down here, uh, reusing this space that's already dedicated to fire because this really is the separation line between police and fire. Police is right over here. This would be um, EMS storage uh, over here. Um, here's the EMS clean room with the sink and the fridge and the EMS general storage room. Uh, a custodial closet where you could store supplies for cleaning uh, the bay. Uh, with its own slop sink inside and your electrical room, uh, including an emergency electrical room that the generator would be piped to uh, with a two hour rating. Um, over here is the watch room um, that would uh, give a good view of um, all around the area here. I would like to, uh, as, if the study progresses, I'd try to pull that out a little more and maybe and, and get some uh, get view down in front of the station. But this is developed as a tower that when it goes up to the building and off this mezzanine, which is above, this can be used for training um, purposes inside the building. This right here separates really the apparatus and support area from admin and public. Rem uh, remember, we brought the public entrance to the back where you saw on your site plan the public parking here and now the public would enter the building uh, from the back into a vestibule and then into a lobby waiting area um, which is directly off the EOC. We developed the EOC as a one story um, L or addition. This would be able, we'd be able to control the size of this room without affecting the rest of the footprint. We wanted to push it and pull it if you didn't want to go from that 625 to that thousand. We could without affecting any of the building um, as, you as the scheme would get developed and you'd be looking at pricing. Um, male and female restroom uh, off the admin and public area, uh, all dedicated. And then uh, the stairways up to the um, second floor or uh, the firefighter space, the living quarters. Uh, any questions about the floor plan before we go up? It's in the packet in the 1117. So the second floor, now this would be the apparatus space below, and here's the mezzanine. It's L-shaped with the compressors over here, some storage over here, and this, could, this would be the training area, which uh, 
would also be this tower that would go up to the building, and that's what was expressed on the outside uh, when I went ahead in the slides. Um, these are the firefighters' uh, bunks and lockers. Uh, a design we like to use today is instead of making uh, gang locker rooms and um, gang showers, we do individual toilet rooms with showers and um, individual bunk rooms that can become doubles uh, with the lockers right outside of their bunk room. Let me uh, pop ahead and blow it up. Here's what I was discussing. So uh, this would be a typical uh, bunk room, 11 foot 2 by 12.6. Um, we have it set up right now where there would all be singles, but you could double your staff within these rooms without adding on to them. The lockers are simply outside their rooms rather than a big gang locker room. And uh, the bathrooms um, are a private bathroom that has a shower and a toilet within it. Um, don't get confused by the urinal. We, that's not made for two people to use at once. It's just made that um, a urinal could be used instead of the toilet in the men's room. So these are all the bunk rooms. Uh, this would be the laundry area. And here's two bathrooms and toilets over here and a third one over here. That would be a woman's. This would be dedicated to a woman's room. This would be two men's room over here. Um, here's your two egress stairs. And then um, after, uh, towards the back, towards the back of the lot, uh, with plenty of daylight coming in, would be the living areas, such as the kitchen with an island, a dining table, and a day room, uh, where you could watch television or hang out and socialize. This is that one story EOC below. And here's that entry portico on the first level where you'd come in. Um, any questions on the second floor? Uh, we already talked about the zoning. Were there any questions about the zoning? This would be the north elevation. Here's your bays as they exist, the existing doors that I showed you before. This here would be all new. Uh, this is that tower. That would be the watch room and radio room up front and uh, have a training capacity up on the second floor off the mezzanine. These doors would remain in this scheme. Uh, this is the south elevation now. The elevation where the public would enter from the back. This is that EOC, that room that we maybe could stretch if you want to get bigger. The living quarters up above this, and uh, three new doors in the back. That's the west elevation, the one along the side. Here's where the turnout gear is, so no windows. And these are just some windows that would let light in high up off the mezzanine. These would be windows in the bunk rooms, and again, back out to those living quarters. And um, this would be all windows and admin and whatnot. So a lot of natural light coming into the building. Uh, let's just show you a quick section. Uh, we had developed the sections in, into um, uh, actual construction materials so we could get some uh, cost data on what something like this would cost. So here is, this is the 57 apparatus bay that you can see right here, with the average height of 14 feet from slab to the bottom of the joist. Here's where um, we took the 90, this is the, where we took the 2000 addition out and uh, pushed out to that same line, but with all our new construction over here. And you can see the two story addition in the back. Uh, this clearly shows where you would have some snow drifting that you would have to uh, reinforce for. Uh, taking a section the other way, this is through that uh, two-story space where the bunk rooms would be above and public and admin would be below. Um, all the walls and apparatus support would be uh, CMU or block walls. Um, uh, uh, they'd be all masonry walls in that area. And the floor system here is a, a, a precast concrete plank. Uh, makes for real good separation. We have to separate um, these upper floors by the apparatus functions uh, by an hour. And that makes a real good separation. It's very efficient. Brick veneer. So the, that, that auxiliary building that we talked about, it's 40, it's 40 by 60 or 2,400 square feet. It's located on the northwest corner of the parking lot. It's used for both general storage and apparatus vehicle store and vehicle storage. The building is also used as a work and repair shop. It's heated with ceiling-mounted gas-fired space heater units, 
and it's frequently used. Uh, it, it's it's frequently used, and it's in it's in very good condition. Uh, however, its location is right where uh, any expansion would want to go. Uh, so uh, it would make sense to move that out to the far northwest corner of the site, as it shows on that floor plan, and that would allow for uh, proper expansion of the, of the building. Um, the police department, uh, we, we've um, provided one with a space needs assessment so we can look at the uh, building as a whole and not just the fire department side um, uh, to uh, you know, foresee the future and make sure we're not making a mistake for the expansion of that side. And also um, at the meeting they expressed a concern like I talked about with the accessibility into the building which is shown in these photos. This is what I'm talking about with the accessible route. Here's your handicapped parking spaces. Uh, this exceeds the slope that you can have uh, uh, in an accessible route. And then uh, it takes you either to these stairs uh, all the way around uh, this grass front into the front of the building. Uh, it doesn't currently work. Here's the front of that building. Here's those stairs you would have to go up if you didn't go all the way out to the sidewalk and back around. And you can see that uh, these are getting filled with water, uh, freezing and thawing and just, just uh, push apart. So at a minimum, uh, these would have to be removed and replaced. And then we'd bring some handicapped parking out right out front here that you could turn right in on, uh, which I've been told uh, was there at one time and was removed. So conclusions. Uh, the, immediate task, the immediate task at hand is to determine the feasibility of constructing a two-story addition to the existing fire station side of the Rainham Public Safety Building. Um, and we did that. And um, the answer is uh, no, you could not just directly build on top of that uh, 5B type construction uh, from the 90s. Uh, we've carefully analyzed the site, the existing buildings, and developed a space need assessment in order to fully understand the feasibility of adding onto and renovating this building. So the space needs assessment and study of the existing buildings um, prioritizes things. Um, you know, should we be uh, uh, trying to build a second story on 5B construction before we get some of the equipment we need or clean up the apparatus support bays and decon areas? Um, in our opinion, the answer is no. So the current 3.21 uh, uh, acre site on Orchard Street could uh, accommodate an updated modded fire station, although no, uh, challenges do exist, like we saw in that site plan. The existing building was built in 57 as a DPW bond. The, uh, uh, the existing apparatus bays are located within the space of the 57 construction. Uh, public operations, firefighter living quarters, and support facilities are located in later additions to the original structure. The 1957 building is type 3B construction, which is conducive to an apparatus bay use. However, it is not sprinkled and in need of substantial upgrades to the envelope. Uh, the, uh, utilities and floor plan layout and the HVAC systems uh, need upgrading. The latter additions are of 5B construction and are not conducive to supporting the new construction of a second floor addition. Uh, Compass Group Architect will not build on top of these existing additions. An, excessive, an extensive space needs assessment was performed for this uh, uh, feasibility study and the following conclusions were made out of that. Uh, given Rainhan's populations and needs, the size of a new in, uh, industry standard firehouse is 20,909 square feet. The absolute minimum size of a newly renovated facility is 18,049 square feet. The current uh, facility operates out of 4,425 square feet. The detached auxiliary building should be moved to the rear northwest corner of the property to allow for the proper development of the site. The existing masonry veneer is absorbing water and showing signs of saturation and failure. Uh, these masonry walls are soaked. Uh, you can see it all over the place exhibiting signs and it's coming apart in some areas when it freezes. The existing EPDM rubber membrane needs repairs and needs to be replaced within the next five years maximum. The existing gas-fired boilers need to be replaced. They're past their lifespan. The existing boiler chimney um, needs to be replaced um, almost immediately. The existing wood fascias uh, up, up uh, around the firehouse need to be replaced. The building's brick, but it has wood fascias uh, all around it. 
The existing electrical and emergency electrical systems need to be upgraded. The existing building will need a fire sprinkler upgrade. Uh, separate, uh, uh, there's an idea of possibly separating fire from police with a two hour wall to allow the phasing of this, of this project. You would design the main for both, but you possibly could phase it by separating with, with two hours. Um, the existing building needs new toilet and shower facilities with greater gender separation. There are many safety support issues for firefighter operations that need to be resolved and or added before any living quarter dormitory upgrades can be made. These must be a priority. That proper zoning and, and decon and apparatus support should be the priority. Uh, there are essential firematic equipment items that need to be purchased for the department. We did uh, an equipment list. I think I put it in the packet. Uh, we assessed what equipment they have and what equipment is needed for a fire station um, uh, of this size. And um, there's pricing on there also, which would give you an idea of what that equipment would cost to come up to where um, a station of this size would be. Uh, at a minimum, the police department needs to address the existing handicap accessible route from the existing parking area and the deteriorating plant as an entry. And I think that's it. Um, we um, we um, looked at the cost of some new um, of fire station construction, and I think Rick is going to talk about that. Everybody needs a break. Uh, Andy and his team spent, as you know, as you can tell by the amount of information you received, an extensive amount of time uh, looking at this facility. And uh, I think that if you didn't know it already, we come to this conclusion very early on. Uh, but uh, one of the biggest issues with working with communities in the public is education. And uh, you can say something, uh, but you really need to prove it, uh, and you need to show it. Uh, my suggestion would be that if you haven't been to the fire station, go through it, take a walk through. Uh, it won't take you very long. Um, and you'll start to realize some of the areas that Andy and his team has pointed out here. Uh, and the big issue for us is safety. Even something as simple as when he pointed out the, uh, the floor drain and the apparatus bay uh, and that they're inadequate. Um, the reason they're inadequate is because those apparatus, if they're, in some cases they're being, maybe being washed in the facility or they're coming in and they're dripping uh, and the floors get wet, uh, you really need to have an, an efficient collection uh, means to get the water off of the floor. Uh, because your first responders are racing to that equipment that will later uh, call 15 minutes later. So we're looking at every aspect of a facility and, and what is the right design and what's the right way to treat a facility. Um, we went through and had uh, this scheme uh, that was presented. Do you want to put that budget up, Andy? I don't know if you have it. Yeah, go back, yeah. Um, we had this uh, scheme uh, professionally estimated. Uh, to give us an idea as to where uh, where we see the costs today. And those costs were escalated out to, say, if we were to start design and put it out to bid, would be the start of construction in the fall of 2020. So we've already added in a, a year of inflation. Um, it's, you know, it's sticker shock. It's, a, it's sticker shock for all communities. Uh, we've, we've done this uh, a number of times uh, for police and fire facilities. And uh, again, the biggest part is education. Uh, but the total cost to renovate this facility, because there really is nothing left of that facility, it, it all needs to be renovated. Uh, you know, and you talked about the structure and the lateral frame of, this, of the facility. To rebuild there, that station, the apparatus space that exists today need to be renovated, and then we're building new for every, everywhere else. Uh, the estimates, including um, escalation and uh, and you know uh, a lot of assumptions because we don't have a full design. Uh, the building would, would cost uh, in the range of about 9.5, uh, dollars $9, to renovate and build new there. Uh, and then there's soft costs associated with that. And a, a healthy budget, a uh, normal budget, is usually going to run about 20% soft cost to hard cost. Uh, and so we we did an extensive uh, detailed budget for. Uh, for the committee uh, that we've, we've sort of uh, scrunched that down because it gets a bit overwhelming when you're looking at 20 or 30 different line items. But we've looked at the radios, we've looked at, uh, we've included costs for radios and towers and uh, furniture, 
and all of the elements that go into a new facility, but we sort of scrunched that up for you so you could see it. Uh, and then we've added a contingency of 10% at this point uh, because we think that that's a healthy way to look at a project uh, at this stage in the project. We've got a lot of information, but the design has not been progressed very far at all. Uh, so the total cost for construction, uh, uh, if we were to start uh, you know, building it next fall, would be about $530 a square foot. And the all-in cost for the uh, development budget, uh, including the soft cost, would be about $740 a square foot. Now, uh, that it's, when people look at that, they say, you're crazy. That's just, not, that's just way too much money. That's too expensive. Uh, you're, you're building too much. Uh, we do this for a business. Uh, we do this for a living, excuse me. Um, and uh, a couple of what we did, we ran this budget, we did this estimates. I didn't even look at any of our past projects. I kind of know where they're going to fall. Uh, but then I went back and did a comparison uh, of two facilities that are about the same size of the community. Uh, and the uh, Brewster Fire, which we just opened in 2018, um, was about 22,000 square feet, 23,000 square feet. And those numbers were uh, right in line. Uh, we, were, we, we finished that up at about 573 a square foot hard cost and 744 for uh, soft. And the Chatham Fire, we opened in 2016, same size community at 20,600 square foot facility. And those numbers were a little bit less, but in the same line as what we're, what we're seeing here today. It's municipal construction, chapter 149 regulated. Uh, you know, everything has to follow procurement and, and low bid uh, rates. And so we've got a lot of history as to where we start projects and where we end them. Uh, the numbers that we're giving you here, uh, we're showing you as an example as to what this will look like. Uh, we've, we've included a healthy contingency. We firmly believe that a, uh, a, a, a valuable budget is going to include a contingency. But our goal is always to turn back uh, to the community uh, with, uh, with, uh, with contingency, mon contingency monies left over. And uh, that's been the practice uh, for all of our budgets for the last 15 years. And, you know, we're just finishing up, uh, we just finished uh, uh, Dighton Police. We turned back, uh, I don't know how much uh, money in contingency there. Lake, yeah, Lakeville, uh, we just opened up. Uh, we're opening up Dart uh, Dartmouth in about three weeks. Uh, so we've got a lot of buildings in the community, as does Andy and the Compass Group. And the goal is to make sure that you have the money because you can't go back to the till, uh, but uh, don't spend it if you don't have to. So this is an example of uh, what this project would cost. I need to stress that this does not include the temporary facilities. So you would need to, if you're going to be building and renovating in this site, we're going to need to move at least the administration component, uh, component of it and the day room component, component um, out of the building so that we can uh, so we can work around and they can uh, we can coexist safely uh, we've had a, several uh, temporary facility projects we've given you a range at this point uh, temporary facility is going to cost in the range of 300 uh, to upwards of nine hundred thousand dollars depending upon the extent uh, how extensive uh, the temporary facility is to give you an example in Chatham we relocated the fire department operations into uh, scaled down mobile home units uh, that were mulled together. Uh, so we used those mobile homes as their day area sleeping quarters and we had a separate mod for the administration. And we were able to do that very, uh, very efficiently and economically and that cost was around 250,000, 260,000 three, four years ago. Uh, Orleans police, they wanted to go in a different direction. They wanted a fully uh, operational, modular, purpose-built modular unit. So basically, you design it, you specify it, you purchase it, they build it, they bring it, they mull it, to the, mull it together on the site, and then at the end of the day, nine times out of ten, they just throw it away. Uh, there's, unless the town has another use for it. And that costs, uh, in today's dollars, about $900,000 for a short period of time. It's it's amazing, uh, but you know this is what we have to go to to make sure. It's one thing to get the department to a safe facility. It's another thing to make sure that over the next two years, two and a half years, while you're doing this, that the that the department can operate uh, effectively and still uh, 
you know, protect the community. That's where this, you know, boils, uh, boil, this, this, that's what this boils down to at this point, if we're going to meet the goals and objectives of a basic plan. Uh, this does not consider the, 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 the full 20,000 square feet that would be the ideal as compared to other communities. I would recommend that you do some research uh, and, you know, and look at, uh, we, can, we can bring you to a number of communities and you can, we can have you tour our facilities. Uh, you know, and we're, not, uh, we're not breaking new ground here. Uh, this is being done uh, from one community to the other. And what's happening is the communities are starting to realize that they've spent, you know, they've, they, they've taken care of their schools, they've taken care of their libraries because of the, the, the reimbursement factors and the need. Uh, in many, many situations like police and fire have been left, uh, left to the side, but it's, there, there comes a time that it has to be dealt with. The problem doesn't go away. That's, uh, you know, that's the reality of it. Uh, you know, a simple fix today wouldn't even, uh, wouldn't even address the needs of the department. And if you can decide, to, you know, a year from now, you can decide three years from now, four years, or you can just, you know, put it underneath the table. The problem doesn't go away. Uh, and uh, the department, uh, at this point, if you can see by the pictures and you can walk around, you know, we think there's some, there's some substantial risk there. That's pretty much we're open for questions and answers at this time. You can't, you can't go straight to a second story without addressing apparatus support. So that space, uh, first and foremost, apparatus support needs to be addressed, uh, such as fill station, uh, decon, uh, toilet facility, you know, the proper shower facilities. That has to be addressed first, and that, that has to be where it has to be proper zoning, right? Uh, you just can't take this stuff, put it on a second floor. Can't do it. It has to be right there, right off the apparatus bay. So, priorities. Do you have any idea, after having looked at the police station, what something like that would, would cost, similar to what you addressed here, you know, the basics. I, and, and would it be better off if both were done at once, or? There's certainly economy to scale if you do a public safety facility. Uh, we're, we're just in the process of opening a new public safety facility down in Sandwich, where we have a new, new PD and a new FD uh, on, on site. Uh, it's really, uh, whether or not you have a site that can that can uh, handle that uh, size facility, we can give you the numbers. Uh, we can give you the, the history of, of all of our police station projects and, and give you an idea as to where those square foot costs fall. It's very easy to do. Uh, so it's certainly something to consider. Uh, but, but that was not our charge here. So uh, and uh, one thing important about the site and having one station is, I believe the location is good. So um, it's got that going for it. It's, 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 a, it's a good location for your one station. Uh, that's something to think about. However, um, what does bother me a little bit about this site is um, the walls. Uh, those walls are just saturated with water. And um, you know, you can't put good money to bad. So um, I, you know, if you did, if this project went forward and you renovated, you'd really have to take that brick veneer off get that envelope insulated properly and then come back with uh, a veneer that's going to uh, drain the water properly when it gets on there. Those walls are so good. I think unfortunately too, this, this feasibility study has shown that our original concept is kind of out the window. And, uh, and if it's like this on the fire side, what does it look like on the right. fire side? If you're going to build the 13 million renovation on the fire side, you know, again, are we throwing the bad money at it? Something I just, if you, uh, my partner Taylor McDonald just showed me his numbers. Uh, we just opened up, we had a ribbon cutting uh, yesterday in Lakeville for Lakeville PD, and that came in at just north of 733 a square foot uh, the entire development project. So it's right there in line for the police sections. Rick, in some of these uh, places that you've done, uh, has there been any uh, availability of public kind of funding, grant money, et cetera, that these other communities have tapped into? Unfortunately, no. We have not, uh, we have not, we've, we, we, we received a design uh, award for Brewster, uh, 
and out of Firehouse Magazine, but it didn't come with any money. It came with a nice poster. We received the silver award, which is fantastic, but uh, it, there's no grants available that we've been able to, uh, we've been able to identify at this point. For equipment, it's a different story, uh, but uh, for the facilities, it would be nice, but we haven't seen it. Yeah, we've seen separate departments be able to get equipment grants, um, but uh, the grant side of things is, is more for schools and libraries that we see. Got the uh, sandwich facility that we're kind of doing now. Got the combination boots and fire. Is that all completely new construction? That's all new construction. And how many square feet is that? Jeez, I don't have the numbers right off the top of my head. I believe that was 22,000 for the police, and um, the fire was around 11,000. And that's the police is open now, and the fire is well, they're actually out there. They're all open, yeah. Just so open up the front standpoint. Barbecue. Thirteen. Falling. Okay. Seventeen. Well, I was talking about construction. Both the police and the fire. New construction. Yeah. But that was bid two and a half years ago. So we would have to, you know, normally what we do is any numbers that we use, we uh, at the point of bid, we will escalate them to today's dollars. Uh, because, uh, the, Depending upon your bidding environment, you get good prices or higher prices. So we, we generally work off of escalation on an annual basis. And I know the town of Mansfield just opened a fire, police, and uh, highways on the same grounds are not connected, but that was about $25 million. And I believe Plainville is in the $30 million range, but they have a fire, police, and town hall. That they kind of construct all Does this site support uh, a new police station, or is it too small? Personally, I, I, we, you've been able to do a study to show us we could build a new fire station in the back and still keep everything open in the front. But to do a public safety facility on that site, I think we would be looking at a lot of temporary facilities for a short period, you know, for the duration. I can't imagine of, uh, of keeping operations, both operations going, and building a new public safety facility. Renovation is not an option. So, uh, yeah. so if, if we were starting with that as a pad site with nothing on it, yes. But you, now you have to get into the logistics of, okay, um, what are you going to do? Temporary facilities for both and level it? Phasing? But a lot of logistics there that would equate to costs. But if it was just uh, that site, um, from what I know of it, you could uh, fit a fire and police. But it would be a logistical nightmare. What's the lifespan of this uh, fire station? Uh, a new one? What, what uh, you're proposing. Okay, um, so what I'm proposing, um, like I said, you'd have to address those walls uh, on, that, on that police side. And I would like to see that uh, on the programming side of these, these go at least 20 to 30 years in the future, just on the programming and the way they function. For and space. Then, and then the building itself, you know, 50 to 100 years. When uh, when the selectmen started the building committee to look at this, we were doing this for about a little over six months. And last week we had a meeting and we went through all of the uh, scenarios. We looked at three different layouts, three different plans, and we didn't actually take a vote last week. How what, how we felt or what our opinion was, but it was the general consensus that spending this kind of money on the existing fire station uh, is not worth it. The reason why we say it's not worth it is because the structure that you still have there, the old 1957 uh, original building. It's not even insulated. It's not insulated. You got the. You can see all the white line coming through. Uh, a lot of those things are not addressed inside of the. You know this cost. And now you have a police station that you're going to do a two-hour firewall just to separate sprinkler systems. So we. You know, this isn't sprinklerizing the fire. The police station. Um, we did speak with the police chief and 
just last week, uh, he mentioned that if at all possible, he would like to keep the fire and the police together. He said, unlike some towns, they don't get along. He said, in this town, they do, and they work very close together, uh, especially the dispatch area might be either, he would like to see it stay in town. Uh, the state has been kind of pushing cities and towns to a central location, a 911 type dispatch area. Um, but, uh, so looking at, this was the best layout that they you know, had come up with. It, it really it worked out well. It's the money that you're going to spend on three to nine hundred thousand dollars for housing, just to put them up while the new station is being this is being worked around. There, we didn't discuss a number, but anytime you renovate anything, you know, nine million dollar budget for the building itself, there's got to be a million dollars cost in there that is for all of the renovation items alone. So if you take out 900,000, take out 600,000, and take out another you know, million dollars, you're at a million and a half dollars uh, that you could be putting into, you know, taking out of the total budget for the new station or using that money for a police station as a combined unit. Uh, or the square footage of the existing fire station is what a, uh, a secondary fire station would be. If you keep what you have, it would probably cost a million dollars at least to bring that up to safe. Uh, you have all the firemen are in there today without any natural air being brought into the bunkhouse. The one question I didn't ask the other day was have we done any air quality tests with the current fire section? We have not. Because I think, you know, I think that the selectmen, I think that's the first thing that we ought to do because with in the last six, seven months, reviewing a lot of the information for fire stations and what they go through, all of the decon area, the secretaries, everybody's, everybody's at risk that they come back from the fire <laughs> There's no, uh, there's no separation. They're going right into the, the bunkhouse, especially if the bunkhouse doesn't even have any in air intake, and that's constantly filtering the air. I mean, they're sleeping, and, and it's just, it's there's so much negative that has come out of that building. Um, you know, I've been in there ever since the kid getting soda out of the soda machine and sitting on the sidewalk drinking soda. And I never realized until I, when I started this, I went in there. I wouldn't use that toilet if you paid me. <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry, but you know, it does get clean. <laughs> no, not, not that it's not clean. It's yeah. just holy God. I mean, there's a shower in there. Well, um, I think even though we don't have any female firefighters, we do have two female admins. Mm. Yeah, very, very interesting. I didn't ask, but I'm sure, it's, you know, if I was Sally, I'd go home. She lives close by. But I mean, it's just, it's, I'm serious, and I'm not, you know, I'm not making a joke about it. It's, it's pretty nasty, and again, I've lived in Radium since the 60s, and I've been over there an awful lot, and I'm embarrassed that I have it even. I drive by, I don't go in. When did, I do go in, it's specific. Did, did the building committee come up with any conclusion, solution, or decision of any We didn't kind of want to start on that, only because we were directed towards the feasibility study. Well, yeah, that's... And the feasibility study, you know, now it's kind of a... Uh, we have uh, air quality problems. Immediate issues are air quality. The chimney issues, if it lasts that's another winter, I'll be surprised. Uh, mold, with all of the seepage that's coming through. I mean, we don't know if it's... If it's well, that's why I say I think we should do an air quality test inside the building for just for I mean, We might be putting them up in temporary housing because we have to. Dan, just hypothetically, where would you build another public safety building if 
that was a secondary one you said earlier. You know, I had mentioned uh, at our meeting that I think out of this, I think the selectmen should uh, look at putting putting together a group to kind of start looking at the maps, the excessive maps, and seeing what we have available. I started doing it at home, and <coughs> excuse me, there's a lot of small little pieces. Uh, I have a piece in mind, uh, a couple of pieces in mind, but I'd rather not say uh, outside, just you know, I think it's something we should go through. So do I. Yeah, I <laughs> So I think uh, you know the biggest thing is trying to get whatever piece of land that's going to work the least amount of money possible. Obviously, because now we have to put money into that. Now we're taking the money out. Um, I was really surprised. I went online and I looked up. Uh, I went on to a, a five-minute journal. You know, so it's a uh, monthly news news magazine they have all of these uh, new fire stations and new designs and sleeping quarters and it's it's just when you go through it all and you see what the building they had and the building that they built the building they had is Greenham's fire station and I'm saying wow is that old one well I always thought our fire station was nice looking and then when you actually start going through it, you see in the spaces. And what really bothered me the most was the decon area. You know, they, in all these uh, websites, they show this red zone. Like, you know, you do not mix that with the sleeping point. You don't mix, mix that with the offices. Anybody that comes in that building, you go for building permit, you go into the building. Uh, there isn't, uh, you know, there isn't an area in there that would be air quality clean the way it's, you know, as of today. Would you object to meeting with the Board of Selectmen, the building committee, for us to assess this whole situation and then perhaps give them a better direction in which to go? Oh, definitely. I think, okay. I Can think, we do that next week? Yeah, I think Will that would be board, something. Would you set something up, please, please, please? Yeah. Now, I think there was, you know, the reason why Gordon wanted everybody yeah. Three different committees tonight was for the town meeting uh, budgeting for the town meeting now the budget last year I think correct me if I'm wrong we did a million two. two I believe we might have uh, used 40,000 to do this finish the study I think we had 50,000 I think 000. we had that extra we had 50,000 original it would be my recommendation if you look at what's on there it says total owners development cost two million five hundred seventy five thousand I would think that's our goal we know we're going to have I mean, this is no different than doing a sewer extension doing schools doing uh, anything like that so you know if we have if we have the ability to put something in for this year I would look at putting money in for the, our development costs, for the owners, for the town's development costs, and then the rest gets, you know, financed through. Uh, so I think I think the consensus. I think the consensus tonight is to have a meeting in two weeks where we can discuss this further. I, I why Rich is Rick is still here. There are there any questions related to this proposal? Not. Any other locations or costs at this time? Just the proposal as before. Frank, did you have something? Uh, if there's no other questions, I was going to. You, you were talking about sites and searching and so on and so forth. We we do this with most of our communities, uh, and if you want to pursue that and talk about it, and make a decision. If you want to pursue that, what my recommendation would be would be that uh, we put together a pro forma for that site. Uh, because for police, uh, the response time radius is not as critical because the cruisers are on the road. For the fire department, response time radius is very critical. So what we like to do is put together, if we're going to do a public safety facility or even two separate facilities on two separate parcels, just, just 
just throw it out there, we could put together a performa that would identify uh, exactly what the needs are. And from that performa, you can, um, you can request proposals from the public, or the private, excuse me. So there may be a private parcel out there that someone may be interested in donating or selling for a dollar or what have you. You can't acquire private property without going through a uh, RF, process, but it can be done very simply. We establish the performer, we establish rating analysis, and then what you're doing is you, you, you publicize to see what's available out there on the private side, all the while you're searching your town-owned parcels. And then you, know, you establish a decision matrix as to what is the most ideal um, for a, a location for a public safety facility or a fire facility or a police facility. Uh, it's it's pretty standard. If you think that there are private parcels out there that may be advantageous to you, you do have to solicit them properly. So it's just a thought. Thanks, sir. Any other questions for Rick? Um, Gordon, if we have a meeting next week, does that give you enough time if the board decides to use some free cash? Or do you, yeah, that's yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Last call for questions. Anything else from the board? So we'll be on next week's agenda. You guys good? Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.